to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. My name is Daniel Murphy, and I am assistant editor of the journal. If you are new to these podcasts, please visit the Florida Historical Quarterly on Facebook, where you can now access abstracts of each article in the current issue of the journal. Today's podcast features an interview with Gary Mormino, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of South Florida at St. Petersburg. In the interview, Dr. Mormino and I discussed the special issue he recently guest edited for the FHQ titled, 500 Years of Florida History, the 20th Century. This issue is the final component of the series of six special issues published in recognition of the quincentennial of Ponce de Leon's first visit to Florida in 1513. After our interview with Gary Mormino, you will hear two tributes to Michael Gannon and Gerald Schaffner. Both scholars passed away in April of 2017. Please introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your academic background. Well, certainly. My name is uh, Gary Mormino, and I am a uh, I'm the Frank E. Duckwall Professor of Florida History Emeritus at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. Uh, we have a I think it's probably the only graduate program in Florida studies in the state. It was uh, begun in 2003. Ray Arsenal and I began it. And uh, I taught at the USF Tampa campus from 1977 until 2003. So this is my 40th year of teaching in the Florida system, and I taught three years in, at a small school in Illinois, Millican University, for any alumni out there. And it's been a great ride. Uh, never in my wildest dream could have imagined uh, that uh, I would have met so many interesting people and pissed off so many people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, yeah, we're, you know, uh, I think you're at the Florida Study Center. You've established or helped establish at USF uh, St. Pete's. Really, I mean, we're all very happy about that. You guys have done great things for Florida history and culture in ways that other people haven't. So that's quite impressive. Well, the one thing that, that's very gratifying now, as you youngins will understand this later, is to see your students really start making a difference. So one of my students from uh, around 2000 was Pam Iorio, who became mayor of Tampa. But uh, I've, I've got students who are working in museums and teaching, and uh, Thomas Ankerson, the first graduate student of mine, is an environmental law professor at the University of Florida. So it's, it's, it's really great seeing students succeed and, and even surpass you. It's even better. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, shifting gears a little bit. So this is uh, the, the conclusion of the FHQ uh, special issues on the um, 500 uh, or the quincentennial of Ponce de Leon's um, visit to uh, Florida. What, when you were compiling this issue, when you're asking for contributors, what was your vision? What did you want to do with this issue? Well, first of all, yeah, uh, I, would, I would not have uh, organized it chronologically as, as it was. I, I, uh, I think, and this has been a perpetual battle within, I think, the Florida historical community is, is where, where, do you, where are the breakpoints? I think 1920 was a good breakpoint. I'm not sure 1980 was a, a good ending point. Uh, I would have, it seems to me that period between 1920 and 1940 is so, uh, is such a significant period in terms of transition. Uh, but this has always been an issue of, uh, in Florida, you know, if you teach Florida history, do you teach it from the territorial period to the modern era? That seems like an awful lot, but, um, Nonetheless, it is what it is, uh, and it, it, bega it begins in 1920, which is a very formative period. I mean, uh, has there ever been a period of such turmoil and change and real substance as Florida in, in the 1920s? I mean, to put this in perspective, in, in 1920, Florida was just shy of a million people, which is, which is hard to believe. I mean, I think we were the 32nd largest state in the union in 1920 we're a we're the third largest state in the union today a sunbelt mega state uh 21 million people i mean and and in some ways 1920 is the linchpin i think i would argue actually world war ii is the linchpin but 19 you can make an argument for 1920 so the big challenge i think is how in the world do you put all that literature in and i'm sure 
I'm going to be getting letters. How could you have left out my seminal article? S e m i n a l, so not o l e, uh, <laughs> and leaving out friends' books, etc., or just entire topics. Uh, the the other thing uh, about this is is to go back to my days as a grad student, and if if, if any listeners out there ever studied for your your doctoral written, one appreciated a well written bibliographical essay. So you wouldn't have to go through all those books and, and articles. And uh, I, I wanted to avoid simply li- having numbing list of books and articles. So I, I, want, I, I pride myself on, on my writing ability, now whether it's uh, merited or not or, or hubris, but I, I wanted to write an essay – that someone could read and not and not fall asleep reading a long list uh, list of books and, and bibliography. You obviously need uh, in in such a task you have to look at you know the major breakpoints. So the 1920s boom, the 1920s bust, the the real estate bust. But you know though, it, it, within those six or seven years, there's an astonishing uh, change in, in Florida. You have the uh, the great migration continues you have the rise of cities that had not even been envisioned in in 1910 uh, coral gables uh, miami beach uh cities like sarasota st petersburg even orlando are different cities by the end of the 20s than they had been um but at the same time uh, you can concentrate on you know the great developers, and and Arva Parks, by the way, has a splendid new book on uh, Coral Gables and, and George Merrick. You're missing a a very important point. I, I call it the 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 uh, Florida's Counter Reformation. That there is also a a challenge to the change in Florida in the 1920s. You see this with the rise of the Second Ku Klux Klan. You see it in uh, Sydney Sydney Johnson Katz, the governor of Florida, who's who's elected in 1916. They uh, many Flori- rural Flor- Floridians do not like what's happening. This is reflected nationwide, by the way, in in this kind of counter thrust. Well, um, I thought it was interesting you're talking about Florida's counter reformation. And actually, what I was going to ask you next was, um, how does what's happening in in Florida in the 20th century compare to other states, especially in the South, and maybe you know, uh, I guess what we call sunbelt states today. Do you see a lot of parallels or do you see more differences? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, you know, I studied at the University of North Carolina in late 60s and 70s, and uh, Florida was never mentioned. I, I can't recall Florida ever mentioned or a book ever assigned about Florida, which may tell you something about the state of historiography in Florida at that time. And it, it, that's that's one of the que- central questions, I think, is and it's a, a fascinating parlor question for a class. Uh, is Florida a southern state today? And most people would probably say no, because it needs lots of qualifications. You know, are you are you living in, in Greenwood or Key West, obviously? <laughs> but I think you begin to see Florida peel away from the Deep South beginning in the 1920s. Now, you could make an argument earlier, but I, you, you see this uh, in the, the economy. But the, the simplest explanation is that every day you've got you know, um, northern migrants moving here. And it's not that the black population is declining, but each decade from 1920 on, the black population declines until I think about 10 years ago. Florida, I think, when the in 1920 had 33 percent. I think the one in three Floridians was was black. So that's that's a, that's one one big theme going on. Um, to your to your question about where Florida fits in, it it resembles in many ways a middle southern state, a Kentucky or a Tennessee or a you know a Missouri more than more than the deep south states. Uh, Saying that, it, 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 that's true except for race relations. Uh, Florida's rates of lynchings uh, is, is very high. Uh, 
during the 1940s when you had relatively few lynchings in the South. The lynchings in Florida are so outrageous. The Claude Neal lynching and then the uh, the lynching in 1944 in Mariana. You know, Florida was a, a deep South state. It's a uh, Jim Crow state. Curiously, though, in, in 1944, in, in 1944, you have a important so, uh, Supreme Court decision, Smith versus Allwright, which abolishes the black, uh, the white primary, which had been, you know, an important part in Florida in prohibiting blacks from voting the only election that counts. Florida is one of the few southern states – Florida resists this, but by 1950, the number – the percentage of blacks voting in Florida is dramatically higher than in Georgia or Mississippi. It's more like Tennessee's or Virginia's uh, record there. So you, you begin to see Florida peel away, uh, and there are really two Floridas. Uh, and and there's, that's been true for some time, but uh, the old line from the, the guide to the southernmost state, the WPA guide, that to travel north in Florida, you, ha- you need to travel south and vice, and vice versa. That was am- that's amplified each decade. An- another important distinction between Florida and, and other s- southern neighbors was um, immigration. Even though if you look at, uh, if you, if you look at immigration in Florida – Compared to Illinois, it's it's pathetically small. But when compared to every other southern state except Louisiana, it's dramatically higher. And, and curiously, uh, I, I think many listeners will be shocked that in 1920, you know, yes, you have uh, Italian, Spaniards, and Cubans in Ybor City, and Cubans in Key West and Bahamians in Key West and Slovaks in Slavia and Czechs in Masaryk Town. But the two biggest immigrant groups are Canadians and, and people from the British Isles. But they, they don't form classic immigrant colonies. But Florida, each decade thereafter, Florida's immigrant population will, will grow, and that's, that really distances Florida from other southern states, the, the, the composition. Uh, also, Florida has more northern, more northerners. There. I point out, I mean, what other southern state? And there, there may well be some. Florida has a uh, G.A.R. Hall in in St. Petersburg, and Confederate statues in uh, St. Cloud and in uh, somewhere in North Florida. The name name I've forgotten. That would be cries for revolution in other southern states. <laughs> That's very true. It's, and, you know, you make a good point. And you do this in, in your, your broader scholarship as well. I mean, it, when, when someone asks you, where does Florida fit in? I mean, it, it, it depends on where you are in Florida. It's, it's very hard to have a broad brush strokes when you're trying to talk about uh, any kind of certain characteristics of Florida. Um, yeah, I, I, I always use – I've used this line many times. But to the question, just where does Florida belong? I said it's either – depending where you're standing, it's either the southernmost state or the northernmost province of the Caribbean. And that was true in, in 1800 and 1700, but all too well in 2017. Yeah, most certainly. Well, I, I, I don't want to get in the weeds too much, but you did mention um, historiography a bit, and, and I want to ask it kind of in a general <laughs> way. Um, sure. Where do you uh, – what, what do you think of the, the, the state of Florida history studies today? Do you, do you think it's a healthy, vibrant field, or is it going the different direction? Or, or what, what should listeners know about where Florida history is going? That, that is a tough state, and I, I must admit I, I, I tend to alternate my opinions uh, at times. So in, in writing this, in some ways, I, in, in some fields, I'm really impressed. In race relations. Wow, if you look at the scholarship in the last 40 years, you know, begun by people such as uh, UCF's Gerald Schaffner, it, it's extraordinary the sheer number of books and articles advancing, uh, uh, looking at the civil rights movement. In, in other areas, it's embarrassingly uh, scant. I, it's hard to believe that no one has written a sweeping history of Florida and World War II. I mean, I I think Florida, World War II was far more transformative in in some ways of Florida than than almost any other event, and and yet in part it's it's 
by the way, I'm working on this, so I'm, <laughs> I'm embarrassed that it's not out yet. But I'd also warn younger scholars, wow, this is a tough study uh, to do. There's, I mean, so on the eve of World War II, Florida was still the the smallest state in the in the in the Deep South. Arkansas and South Carolina had more people than Florida in 1940, and and by the, there are 10 military bases in Florida on the eve of World War II. By the end, there are 200. The best estimate is that two million servicemen came here during the war, but we still don't have a study of World War II. We have no biography. I mean, the the overall work is pretty good. You know, the work done by David Colburn and Richard Shear and some splendid biographies by Martin Dykeman of of Askew and Collins. But there's no biography of Spencer Holland. That, that's, uh, Spencer Holland is an important figure in Florida. Uh, no biography of Millard Caldwell, uh, a really important figure in, in Florida. Uh, there's still a lot more to be done, and I'm not optimistic that it's going to be done. I mean, let's face it, you know, to tell a young, talented senior undergraduate student that you really need to go to grad school and get a PhD in study Florida would be almost cruel given the job market. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not hopeful that we're going to have a, a glorious new future, but there, there's some very promising signs and some discouraging signs at the same time. In the world, the world of Florida history has really changed a, a, a great deal. I mean, since, I started out in 1977. The Florida Historical Society was really at the center. I mean, uh, the annual meeting was a must be. We we now inhabit a very fragmented Florida studies community in Florida, if you'd even call it a community. Uh, different new PhD programs, competing lectures, competing programs. I, I don't think it's as intimate a world as we had it, but I suspect in 1977, Charlton Tabot would have told me the same thing. You know, it is not, it's never what it used to be. <laughs> as, as aging historians have their Jeremiads about this young generation of scholars. <laughs> so there is, you know, and I understand exactly what you're saying. I guess the, the, the positive spin on it is there's still a lot of a lot of gaps in Florida historiography oh, that, yeah. that people need to fill, and you know, so that should be encouraging to anybody that's interested. Yeah, I think you're right. Yes, I I have no regrets. I mean, I in my wildest dreams, I could imagine that my life would be as fulfilled as, and I would never have dreamt Florida was when I grew up in Illinois. Florida was off my radar screen. No spring break, <laughs> and I was studying Italian immigrants in St. Louis. But after 40 plus years, uh, you know, I, I, I would I would echo your sentiments that this is an exciting field for people to get into. Well, well back just briefly back to the uh, the special issue. Um, you know, you you said what you were able to cover, what you couldn't cover. Um, difficult task, but it, for for the audience that hopefully are going to read the special issue, uh, what what are the things that stand out? What if if you were going to take a couple of things that you wanted them to know more than anything else? What do you think they should get out of this special issue? Well, the uh, it, it, you know anyone who's me, I mean, in fact, I'm guessing many uh, many uh, listeners will have only been here a few years, and you might think, well, Republican Party has always been a mainstay in Florida. Wow. I mean, for much of this period, there's there's even a period in 1937 when the Republican Party vote in, in the 1936 election, you know, when Roosevelt was just unbeatable, the Republican, the, the number of Republican voters fell below the threshold to have official party status. And there was, <laughs> there was actually debate in the Florida legislature whether they should ax the Republican Party, and they decided, you know, that they didn't want them in the Democratic Party, so so they gave them a special exemption. But uh, the the rise of the Republican Party is a is a great topic, and it's been pretty well covered. Uh, the election in 1966 of um, Claude Kirk is a thunderbolt. I mean, uh, you know, you really have two elections. I, I think I talked about the other one was in 1954. Bill Cramer, if you go to Tallahassee today, uh, Bill Cramer is always followed by Mr. Republican. He is Mr. Republican. He was the one of the first Republican congressmen uh, 
elected in the South since Reconstruction, and the first in Florida. He was a St. Petersburg resident. I interviewed him shortly before his death in in '03. Th- that's huge. And it look when 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 Kirk is elected in '66, it looks like this could, because nationally the 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 recoil of Americans from the Great Society, the excesses of the '60s. It looked like this was going to be a Republican decade in the '70s as well. But Kirk was so quirky and so such a goofball. That he screwed things up, and in this 1970 election, you know, do you ask historians? I think what are the most significant elections in Florida? They talk about 2000, but 1970, just when the Republicans had early momentum, Bill Cramer is defeated in the race for uh, governor, and uh, Lawton Childs wins the U.S. Senate election. So the the uh, Askew Askew and Childs are elected and and kind of revive the Democratic Party. Until uh, really, the uh, I don't think the Republicans take over Florida completely until around 2000. So that that would be one. And the scholarship is pretty good. Um, I can't remember the name. It was a UCF scholar who did the Claude Kirk biography. Readers can look it up. Oh, yeah, but, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, Coburn, uh, David Coburn, who was a classmate of mine, by the way, at, at Chapel Hill. Has has a really good book called "From Yellow Dog Democrat to Red State Republicans." That's it. From <laughs> Yellow Dog Democrats to Red State Republicans. I helped them with that title. I should add, but um, it's a very good overview. So in politics, there's there's some pretty good history of Florida, but some real gaps. You know, I mentioned uh, several of the biographies that are missing. Which, for instance, in a state like North Carolina, that would be unthinkable of of, of a politician of Sp- Spencer Hollins status not to be covered by a biography. Comparing the other states, by the way, uh, if Florida historians ever saw how, how uh, state history is handled in Texas, they'd either run or uh, open a checking account. Uh, Texas, you know, <laughs> your book sales would be much better in Texas. Well, so, so one, one thing's for certain is uh, politics in Florida has, has always been a hot topic, will probably continue to be so into the future. Um, on that note, is is there anything else you'd like us to know about your uh, about the special issue or about your research in general? Just anything uh, the audience should know about um, anything you think uh, is, is important. Well, you know, I feel bad. In uh, uh, w- another one of my former students was Jack Davis, and uh, Jack has a new book out. Well, you, this would make an interesting podcast of of asking historians. How, the, how would you go about organizing and conceptualizing a history of the Gulf of Mexico? And, and Jack has a new book out. Uh, I think he could well win the Pulitzer Prize. But uh, the, the one thing that's also been covered well that I, that I forgot to add is uh, Florida environment. You know, this was a topic before 1950. I'm not sure anyone had, had written about, but oh, wow, you've got a half a dozen really good books on the Florida environment. And Jack, before this latest book, Jack, by the way, is at the University of Florida, uh, did a, a magisterial biography of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And then before that, of course, you had The Swamp by Michael Grunewald. And then many decades before that, uh, the book Land in the Water, Water in the Land. Uh, so uh, with, with lots in between there. So that Florida environment, I, I'm predicting that will be increasingly well focused topic. And and another thing, a final thing to add, I guess, is uh uh non historians are writing some really good material about Florida. Uh let's face it, today Florida is must see T V, uh, you know, the Florida man and all that. Uh a a colleague of mine at the Tampa Bay Times, Craig Pittman, has a new book out called Oh Florida. Why Florida Matters in the world and I mean, Florida is is almost at the center of the world now when it was once far on the periphery right so so uh, environment politics I mean you know I, I agree I mean it's wherever you look Florida's there and hopefully that'll channel some more people to be interested in Florida history um, indeed uh, Dr. Mormino I really appreciate you talking to, with us today I mean I, I think um, anyone that knows your work knows that you are 
one of the best Florida historians ever, and, and uh, you're very vital to an underst- a good understanding of the state. So thanks for, for everything you've done. Thanks for the special issue, and thanks for speaking with us today. You're very kind, Daniel. Thank you. Okay. My best to everyone. In this first tribute, Robert Casanello from the University of Central Florida will share his thoughts on the passing of Gerald Schaffner. A generation of scholars are passing away. It is with a heavy heart we must report of the passing of Gerald H. Schaffner from a long illness on April 11, 2017. There is probably no more important generation of historians in Florida with regards to how we still view history today than those of Gerald Schaffner's generation. Schaffner matriculated through his Ph.D. program as revisionist scholars like Kenneth Stamp and C. Van Woodward challenged triumphalist histories of the American past by publishing books on the evils of slavery and Jim Crow segregation, which centered on racism and the evolution of white supremacy. While Stamp and Woodward were expanding their minds, outside campus, the Civil Rights Movement was challenging their social outlooks. Dr. Gerald Schaffner entered the university classroom for the first time as a professor in the fall of 1963, just weeks after Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington. Armed with a Ph.D. and an indignation for racial discrimination, he launched his career confronting earlier generations of scholars who defended racial prejudice and pointed to racism and discrimination of the past as a way to imply that racial equality in the present was not only timely, but judicious. In much the same way, Eric Foner challenged the Dunning School of Reconstruction with his book, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution. Schaffner's own book, Nor Is It Over Yet, Florida in the Era of Reconstruction, inoculated Florida history from William Watson Davis and his Dunning-inspired tome, the Civil War and Reconstruction in Florida. One reviewer of the book noted that Schaffner was pro-radical in his sympathies and mentioned that the title's quote, nor is it over, was more a proclamation that racial discrimination in Florida is no more resolved from Reconstruction than it was when the book was published in 1974, a conclusion I'm sure Gerald Schaffner agreed. Although Schaffner's book is still the standard on Florida Reconstruction over 40 years later, I think the journal articles he wrote in the 1970s and 1980s on black labor in Florida represent the best examples of social history written by a scholar of his generation. He was interested in the intersection of black workers and social justice and wrote a handful of articles on the black convict leasing system that became inspiration for future scholars who produced book-length studies on the topic in the late 1990s and beyond. If we were all students of historiography, then we have to believe that the time produces the historian. I can't believe that a Gerald Schaffner never pursued Florida history. Would the way we know our past still be the same? I offer listeners the alternative. Gerald Schaffner pushed the study of Florida history in the direction we have all come to appreciate. In the final segment of this podcast, Robert Castanello talked with Susan Parker, the former director of the St. Augustine Historical Society, on the legacy of Michael Gannon. Well, I want to thank you for for joining me today to have this discussion about Professor Mike Gannon. And if you could, if you don't mind, could you introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, I'm Susan Parker. I was, um, until six months ago, the executive director of the St. Augustine Historical Society, and I'm a colonial historian. And Michael Gannon was my dissertation director. I'm assuming after your after you finished your dissertation, went out in the field and, you know, made a name for yourself, you obviously kept in touch with him over the years, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> I spoke with him frequently. Uh, I actually grew up in St. Augustine, and so, you know, I heard Michael Gannon's name when I was too young to really have any idea who he was. And so his, his name was familiar before I knew um, of all the things that he had done and why he had such an such an impact on not just Florida history, but as we know, especially with his later studies, his World War II studies, and his other activities, you know, over a much wider field than just the state of Florida. Sure, sure. And I know people who come to Florida history, you know, 
if, if they start at least chronologically, they really have to engage his work because he's done so much, you know, foundation work within the Spanish mission, mission system and the first Spanish period, right? Yes, he has. Um, you know, Mike did some of the some of the early work, and not just did he do the early work. Certainly, it had some other people that had done work as well, because we all rely on earlier historians. And that was one of the things that Mike was so good at was taking, you know, the scholarly work and making it something that the that the general public, the general intelligent public, would be interested in. I'm familiar, and I got I'm admitting this, but I'm I'm only familiar with his. Spanish colonial work. I'm not familiar with his other work. Can you give um, listeners a sort of a sense of what he did outside of colonial Florida? Uh, well, of course, his first his first focus that most of us know about was was his work on early Florida and the role of the church and the missionaries in in settling um, Florida and and of course the southeast, which of course was known as La Florida of the Spanish. They they made much much broader claims than the state boundaries include today. And so he went on to research um, about the U-boats off the, off the coast of the United States uh, during World War II. And in Mike's inevitable way, became friends actually with um, a U-boat captain, had his book um, translated into German, and went on a German book tour with the captain, and then on a book tour of the U.S. with the captain as well. <laughs> And I noticed, you know, I'm on the uh, the board of the Florida Historical Society, and I was asked to kind of put together, you know, materials on his career. So I actually searched through the Florida Historical Quarterly, and I noticed, or at least I felt, I got the impression that he really was sort of a member of the St. Augustine community in a way, sort of like a locally engaged scholar who just kind of made himself available. I mean, am I getting this impression correct? Yes, um, of course he was. He was at the University of Florida on the faculty for a long time. Um, he had been um, at the um, at the uh, at the Cathedral of St. Augustine in the 1960s, uh, but ultimately ended up at the University of Florida, obviously for years and years. And who knows how many thousands and thousands, maybe I should even say millions. I'm not even sure of miles. Mike Gannon put on his cars driving back and forth between St. Augustine to Gainesville because he participated in very many things in St. Augustine. He was asked to do so as someone who was knowledgeable and always had, like I said, once again, I can't overemphasize his way of engaging uh, people with the, uh, with the histories that he told. I don't want to call them stories because he wasn't making them up. He was, he was telling histories. And so he was very much a part of the St. Augustine community, and there were very few celebrations or activities that he wasn't a part of, or certainly wasn't was invited to be a part of, and was usually on, shall we say, the main stage. Great. I want I want to thank you again for for helping us to to remember and memorialize uh, Professor Gannon. I'm very glad to. He was one of my favorite people. Thank you for joining our international audience for this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society. The Society was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in the state of Florida. The Society is headquartered in Cocoa, Florida, and the editorial offices of the journal are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. I hope you have enjoyed the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast and that you will consider supporting future scholarship on Florida history by becoming a member of the Florida Historical Society. We also invite researchers to access back issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly on JSTOR. Thank you again for listening to the Florida Historical Quarterly Podcast. If you enjoy listening to this interview and know of others who enjoy history, please tell them about the podcast and have them find us on Facebook. <laughs>